Good evening. Good to see everyone out on this most holy, one of the most holy days of the year, Ash Wednesday, a day when we begin our Lenten journey as we move towards the cross. It, it is important to dedicate ourselves to come, repent of our sins, and prepare ourselves for that glorious occasion where Jesus not only died for our sins but was raised again. So as we begin this Lenten journey, just a, a couple of reminders. Um, this is a very simple, quiet, contemplative um, uh, service. Lots of, um, of scripture, uh, brief meditation, and then there will come the time when we uh, offer the opportunity to come forward, and you could be marked with the sign of the cross. I want to thank Jonathan for... Uh, burning the, the ashes from last Palm Sunday <laughs> and leaving them in the desk, and uh, Doug for knowing where they were. <laughs> so, so we are very glad of that. And um, So let us come before our Lord for a time of prayer. Let us worship God. God sent Christ into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God loved and endures forever. God is our refuge and strength, a present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. God's love endures forever. Let us pray. Lord God, as we come into your presence, we lift up and open our hearts to you, realizing that we fall so far short of how you have created us to be, and yet you have provided us the opportunity, the way, the truth, and the life, so that we may come into your presence, prepare our hearts, go through spiritual discipline, and the opportunity to learn more, to grow stronger in our faith. Be with us as we begin that journey this day and as we come into your presence with thanksgiving. Our one hymn this evening is hymn number 328, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. In the cross of Christ I glory, towering o'er the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. of life or take me hope this one but part of never shall the last forsake me lo it glows forever than joy when the sun a blessed swimming Fat and fun Bumpers of From the cross The bright and streaming Adds more luster to the day Pain and blessed Sing pain and pleasure by the cross are sanctified. Peace is there that knows no measure, joys that through all time abide. Please be seated.
As we journey through the scriptures, we find throughout the scriptures that that continuous call to confession, a call to repentance, a warning in some parts of the day of the Lord that will be coming, the judgment that will be the Lord's. And so we first turn to the Old Testament, to the, gospel, or to the prophet Joel, the second chapter. And we read these words as the people in that time were preparing for the return and were hoping they, they hear these words of hope but also of judgment. And so from Joel chapter 2, the first couple of verses and then continuing on in 12 to 17, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains. A great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will it be after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind, a grain offering and a drink offering for, you, for the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, father the children, even infant at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room, and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? And then we turn to the second letter to the Corinthians, where Paul writes these words, reminding us that we are to be ambassadors for Christ. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, And an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of labors. Holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, 
in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors, yet are true, as unknown, and yet as well known, as dying, and see we are alive, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet make, making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. And from, finally, from the Gospel of Matthew, we hear this warning from the sixth chapter. Beware of practicing your piety. And this, this always makes me uncomfortable as I stand up here in these fancy robes. <laughs> but, but beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But where you, when you pray, go into the room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your faces so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who sees in secret. He will reward you. Do not, store up your, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust can t are consume and where the thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consume and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Stuart Peck once told the story of an 87-year-old woman who gave up beer for Lent, only to lament the fact that the hard liquor she commenced to drink instead made her brain furry and her tongue fuzzy, or she really couldn't remember which one that was. All of which reminds me that when I was a young, uh, young boy and just starting to figure out what the Christian life was all about, there was a lot about Lent that I did not understand and, in fact, didn't like very much. It seemed like one long, bleak landscape, a season of willful deprivation punctuated by an abundance of insincere denial. Worst yet, Lent began with a mark that only the Catholics had in Rockville, Maryland, meaning that my Catholic friends would go to Mass before school and they would appear at school with these black smudges on their foreheads, which started out, I'm sure, as the sign of the cross, but by the time they had gotten to school, it just looked like they hadn't washed their face. And I knew that this dirty spot was something religious, something I didn't understand something I didn't have, something that set them apart from my Protestant friends, and something that made me feel at least temporarily unholy, not to mention spiritually inferior. But then I would remember Jesus' words as they are read every year at this time, beware of practicing your piety before other people. 
and I would uh, rest secure in the smugness that I knew, well, they were just showing off. Surely, I thought, there was more to the season than dirt, which there is, there was, there always has been. And so, what's the difference? Well, we start with this. Lent is largely our own created event, meaning that belongs to the church rather than to the world. In case you hadn't noticed, the world doesn't really give a thought to Lent. Never has, probably never will. You don't have very many great Lenten movies in the movie theater. But to be sure, the world observes the day before Lent, the season before Lent, the day before, some people call it uh, Pazicki's Day, and some people think it's Gobble Down the Jelly Donuts Day, and some other people think it's Pig Out on Pancakes Day, and if you live in New Orleans, or you visit New Orleans at this uh, time of year, it's Bring Mardi Gras to a Drunken Conclusion. But one wonders how many of those people there are this evening who understand why they stuffed their stomachs, why they soaked their livers yesterday instead of today or tomorrow or Monday or whenever. I think probably there are a few people who gorged themselves yesterday who will fast today and without the denial to follow, does the binge at the beginning of the season make any sense? Does anybody ever think about that? No, as far as the overstuffed and hungover view things this evening, Lent provided just a wonderful excuse, or the pre-Lenten season just provided a wonderful excuse for a party. Except that fewer and fewer people remember what that excuse is. But for us, Lent is the church's way of telling time. How much longer do we have to Calvary? How much longer do we have to Easter? It is the church's way of remembering the adult Jesus and everything and how everything ends with his story rather than the baby Jesus and how everything began this journey. In fact, we're going to have a, the, the uh, tabletop cross here, and we're going to be kind of doing a reverse uh, Advent thing. In Advent, we lit candles each week. and Lent, you put them out. And so it reminds us of where we are in the story. Once upon a time, Lent was a preparatory period, a time of instruction, a time where you got candidates ready for an Easter baptism. Today, it's much more than that, or it can be. For some, Lent is a disciplined effort at self-improvement. Now, more than just 40 days to thinner thighs, or losing weight, or giving something up, Lent might involve a conscious decision to better the self in ways that are deemed necessary physically, but also spiritually. We count the things such as services rendered, habits reformed, chapters in the scriptures read, letters written to loved ones, worship attended, kindnesses rendered, reconciliations extended. While for others, Lent is the church's permission to go and investigate your inner life, your inner faith, to investigate the interior, to be rather than to do something, to deepen one's faith rather than to widen it out, to replicate the 40 days of our Lord spent in the wilderness. That's what we're doing. Staring down, to, you know, Jesus stared down temptation, stepped it up, or stepped up to his obligation. And we must do the same thing. This, we say to ourselves, we mustn't do. Countering also, though, with these are the things that we need to do, that I need to do to get myself prepared. Things like listening for God. 
waiting upon God, meditating, praying, journaling, or making peace with silence. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to do that? As for giving something up or taking something on, well, that's up to you individually. And so is whether you're going to do better or you're whether you're going to dig deeper. You have to be the judge of that too. But you need to ask yourself a question. Which needs more work? My behavior or my inner life? Only you know. All I know is that a genuine Easter rarely comes to someone who has taken no steps to prepare for it. Somebody or something needs to die in order for something else to be born. That is the way the Christian faith goes. Except there's one other thing I know. Every journey begins with the first step, and that is what Ash Wednesday represents. A first step. If the ashes are helpful to you, use them. I'm going to do that this evening. Now that a half century or more has gone by, I have gotten over my feeling of, of being inferior to my Catholic brothers and sisters. I appreciate, as we mark, as the mark goes on my forehead, it no longer bothers me to mimic them. Ashes are a potent symbol. On one hand, they remind us of our mortality. And we have noticed that I'm, and, I, and I've noticed, that I'm not getting any younger. On the other hand, they remind me of my fallibility. And I have also noticed I am not getting any better either. But God seems to know that. And mercifully, it doesn't seem to make a difference. I love the old hymn, Just as I am, waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot. To thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Amen. We confess our sins, and this is one of the most powerful psalms we have in, in the Scriptures. It hits home in so many different ways, and so we are going to read responsively uh, a rendition of Psalm 51, the first 17 verses as our prayer of confession. And so let us read responsively. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For behold, you look for truth deep within me and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Wash me, and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear of joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. I shall teach your ways to the wicked and sinners shall return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness, O God of my salvation. Open my lips, O Lord, 
and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Had you desired it, I would have offered sacrifice, but you take no delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And join me in the litany of penitence. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We have not listened to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess to you, O God, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience in our lives. We confess to you, O God, our self-indulgent appetites and ways and our exploitation of other people. We confess to you, O God, our anger at our own frustration and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. We confess to you, O God, our intemperate love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work. We confess to you, O God, our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to commend the faith that is in us. We confess to you, O God. Accept our repentance, O God, for the wrongs we have done, for our neglect of human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty, accept our repentance, O God, for all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors, and for our prejudice and contempt toward those who differ from us, accept our repentance, O God, for our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us. Accept our repentance, O God. Restore us, O God, and let your anger depart from us. Favorably hear us, O God, for your mercy is great. And now all who would like to can come forward for the imposition of the ashes. you shall return. The lame, from dust you came, and from dust you shall return. From dust you came, and from dust you shall return. Steve, from dust you came, and from dust you shall return. Dust you came, and from dust you shall return. Brenda, from dust you came, and from dust you shall return. Ellen, from dust you came, and from dust you shall return. Sorry. Jim, from dust you came, and from dust you shall return. From 
dust he came, and from dust he shall return. Remember, from dust he came, and to dust he shall return. That's it. From dust he came, and from dust he shall return. <laughs> Jerry, from dust you came, and from dust you shall return. Brenda, from dust you came, and to dust you shall return. Larry, from dust you came, and to dust you shall return. Brenda, from dust you came, and to dust you shall return. you came, and to dust you shall return. From dust you came, and to dust you shall return. Laura, from dust you came, and to dust you shall return. Kevin, from dust you came, and to dust you shall return. <laughs> from dust you came, to dust you shall return. Then from dust you came, and to dust you shall return. Back from dust you came, and to dust you shall return. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and passion of our Savior, bring us with all your saints to the joy of Christ's resurrection. And now God has told you, O people, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. Go and silently contemplate where you need to go this season so that you may come to the full understanding of the resurrection and to eternal life that we journey towards during Lent. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.